we are live a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online episode 325 the last in the back to basic series which is episode number 16 Today we have with us again Dr. Manpreet Singh from uh, Advanced Eye Center, PGI Chandigarh, talking to us on essentials of ophthalmic instruments, part two. Uh, and I think after the last lecture, we are all looking forward to uh, the presentation today. Just to be introduction of Sir again for those who are joining us uh, fresh today. Dr. Manpreet Singh has uh, done his MBBS from uh, Punjab and MS from Chandigarh, and DNB and FRCS and FICO degrees are also to his credit. He has done his short term fellowship. Uh, from uh, inocular plastics and ocular facial aesthetics from Sri Shankar Devan Nitralaya from Guwahati in 2014, and also a short-term fellowship in ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit and ocular oncology from the prestigious L V Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. Currently, sir is an associate professor at Advanced Eye Center, PGI Chandigarh, and his main areas of interest are ophthalmic plastic surgery, lacrimal surgery, dacryology, ocular facial aesthetics, and thyroid eye disease. And as he said yesterday, uh, also to add to the series is his passion for teaching, which we saw last time also. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and over to you. We are looking forward to the lecture today. Thank you, Shafali, for the warm and kind introduction and. Uh... Welcome to the residents on uh, uh, again, and uh, again I should thank uh, Dr. Santosh Nagar sir for giving me this opportunity to be with the residents and sharing uh, some of my experiences of handling the tools with them. So I'll uh, share my screen now. So this. is about the essentials in ophthalmology of thalmic uh, sorry instruments part 2 slides okay so this again i'll start with the same uh, you can say iconic image of uh, people going for their lifetime uh, you know journey over the himalayas and i told you yet in the last lecture also that once they embark on this journey this is difficult okay and uh, one one need to carry good memories like your surgery and we we want to come back home uh, as a happy surgeon so the best thing is to know your tools and i will not uh, repeat that this time i am showing here is you know even these uh, bikers they know how to Put a fused bulb off and replace it with a a new one. You know, like as simple as that. So it is not just that you can drive bike and you will embark on this journey. You have to know the basics of your tools yourself and uh, try to do it. Uh, you know, you yourself. So this is DIY information for you. Just a kind of uh, encouragement if you uh, feel and you know next time handle a surgical instrument, just you know kind of tilt it. Have a look. Have a deeper look over it. What it is made up of? We have covered last time. And uh, while working in a sterile area, we should know instrument sterilization and how we should take its care because it's very important. Once you uh, are posted in a kind of cataract, uh, you can say camp or a very high volume OT where the instruments are coming, you know, relatively faster on a faster pace. we should know that okay this is this properly sterilized and taken care of is it like uh, properly clean uh, washed and something like that uh, so you should know basically and especially if you are going uh, out of your own ot and operating somewhere else that this thing becomes uh, of more importance at that time and in camp setting the camps do happen in uh, far flung places in kind of a like civil hospital operation theater where a team visit from a medical college so but you have to take care of the instrument sterilization and how they are keeping it so basically uh, you have to have a knowledge of it uh, so that your patients do not suffer and you get the best possible outcomes so we'll start with the instrument sterilization and care it is very very important for our fine and delicate of thalmic instruments they become stained with blood sometimes and you know blood has got hemoglobin hemoglobin has got iron iron leads to corrosion when once in when it comes in uh, contact with water or something and get locked get uh, lodged in between the locks 
or the lap joints or the box joints, which we discussed the last thing. So one should know how to debride the instruments properly, how they are cleaned and dried, then packed, then sterilized, and then stored for the next day OT, or you know, they are after sterilization, they are handed over for the same day OT. Uh, Earl Spalding from uh, Philadelphia, he gave this uh, wonderful and very simple categorization of instruments based upon where are these instruments used. He classified the instruments into critical or let me so the instruments are classified into critical, semi-critical and non-critical like as shown in this first column. So the critical instruments are which enter inside a sterile body cavity like peritoneum, eye in the uh, intracranial cavity or wherever what we operate for, bloodstream or any sterile tissue. So the products uh, can be surgical instruments, implants, scalpel blades, needles, cannulas, fake on the hand pieces. What they need, the cleaning process should be sterilization for them. So sterilizing agent or a process is needed. Sterilization, we know, we should uh, be knowing it, that it's basically uh, complete uh, eradication of any uh, infectious agent as well as its spores. So semi-critical instruments which can come in contact with the non-sterile mucous membranes of or non-intact skin like endoscopes, the tip of applanation or indentation tonometer or the probe of contact of immersion biometry, Schirmer strips, closing strips, they basically needs a sterilization is always better, but high level of disinfection is good for these kind of instruments where they come in contact with the non-sterile membrane. So sterilization, as I said, that's always better, but the disinfection does it, does the trick. So non-critical instrument, which comes in contact with the intact skin, like rulers, exothermometers, what we use, ultrasonography probes, blood pressure cuffs, uh, they just need low level of disinfection, even with the washing with soap and water is good enough. So is it very simple to remember what sterilization process it needs and instruments classification, just uh, mention it, Spalding, if someone uh, asks you about it in your examination. Earl Spalding gave it, gave it in, and he uh, is from Philadelphia. So let's uh, learn about how these instruments are prepared and given to us in a sterilized way. First of all, once one surgical procedure is over, be it cataract or DCR or something. So first thing what we do, what we should do is cleaning of the instruments. For that, always use distilled water. We should not use normal saline or VSS. It contains, you know, uh, ions and uh, uh, calcium and other minerals. And so hence, it should be avoided. Adequate ventilation and humidity and temperature control of the room is very important. What is on, on this right side of the image uh, of the slide is ultrasonic cleaner. This is a cleaner. You can see the machine is Sony clean. Basically, what it does, it produces more than 100 kilohertz sound waves and the finer tips of, you know, we saw that lens forceps in the last uh, lecture, lens forceps or suture tying forceps, they got very fine tips. So those fine tips can be sterilized or oh, sorry, the cleaned ultrasonically by the ultrasonic cleaning. How does it work? Just turn it off for eight to 10 minutes. What it does it and remove the micro bubbles before placing the instrument. It works at 150 degree Fahrenheit and grossly clean the instruments. There should not be any grossly, uh, you know, the blood should not be grossly visible or any other thing. Just grossly clean the instruments open the box lock joints and ratchet handles for a better effect of this cleaning. Put them uh, and to prevent cross plating or cross metalling. Do not overload, overload or mix the dissimilar metals like we discussed last time, that tungsten, 
and uh, steel instruments should not be put along them because uh, they will uh, lead to some cross metalling on at ionic basis and after completion of the cycle then remove the instruments rinse them and air dry so the instruments are put over here in bowl tray and again repeating rinsing should be done with the distilled water to remove the surface biofilms and the instruments with lumens like cannulas litter scatterers tubings metallic suction tips should be rinsed with distilled water and air uh, you might have seen your nursing officer rinsing it with the 10 cc or 20 cc syringe the uh, cutters cannulas and uh, you know, any instrument with a lumen or a suction tip for the plant and to rinse it with distilled water and then again with air you can put put a, a high speed air which is coming from a, a small tube you can put that tube inside and that will clean off those distilled water particles from inside the lumen then it's a very important thing i specifically insist on doing it for all of my dcr punches this lubrication it prevents further sticking of proteins and improves life of the instruments i got a germany made uh, not one two uh, endoscopic dcr punches so you have to take care of otherwise uh, yeah a uh, normal cleaning and everything will take care of it but lubrication of the joints and specifically if you can put it over the surface there there the lubricants are uh, uh, spray lubricants also are available and sometimes sister may use silicone oil which sometimes is removed from the eye or sometimes you get it saved uh, which is not used for the patient and for the instruments with a lumen lubrication is not advisable so lubrication should be done for the instruments who have got some complex joints box lap joints and with lumen it's a big no so it will stay stick in there and reduce the lumen and diameter and you know that uh, with the uh, poiseuille's equation if uh, lumen diameter is reduced and it affects the flow rate by raised to the power 4 so what happens after this once we have cleaned it and rinsed it and uh, try to air dry this is a better thing to use a uh, handheld uh, you know this is a hair dryer which uh, sometimes is used at home also by us and use a lint free cloth for uh, regular drying and a regular hair dryer the instruments should be inspected under magnification that that tip sent to uh, to to align for a forceps the cutting edges of scissors are these meeting and approximation of needle holders just close the needle holder put it against any light source if you can see the light coming from any uh, from in between then it's not approximating properly it may lead to some needle twisting or loosening and for suture tying forceps also same thing uh, you look for by these platform based jaws so for those instruments you can you should look for these alignments Because you know, uh, sometimes you might have encountered that limbs sister pucker ni ra hai. So just she should have seen or you should have seen that are these tips or to that is being annoying. That's why you have guide pins also. But guide pins they do some gross job. But for fine things you have you need a, a handheld or a table mounted magnifier. Fine cleanliness and corrosions. for to look for cracks pits burrs nicks etc and other details should be observed that happens under a hand held or a table mounted magnifier okay so you have uh, rinsed cleaned and then dried your instrument now what you need to do is pack it pack before you go for an autoclaving or any other sterilization site so for packing what you need is a tray with the silicone uh, uh, you know pin point that guards for that instruments should not mix or jumble in that tray steel tray that's why we keep that uh, silicone pads in between where which have a uh, uh, small spiky things over there it should keep the instruments there only where you are placed and this image this image this tape is a basically a steam indicator it's a it's having chemicals you can see these arrows these faint lines over here so these are basically chemicals 
which uh, you know the space in between the two lines is used to label the date and time and signature where are they uh, you know who's who has put this tape over this one can sign it put the date when it was packed after packing it and wrapping it in uh, linen before autoclaving put this tape over here and this uh, tape you can see this turns black after the autoclaving cycle is complete so this is an indicator chemical indicator that this pack particularly has been sterilized and is ready for use you can see this and this after autoclaving Okay, let's cover up these techniques of sterilization. Techniques, I'll go slow for these because these are the most important things for you can remember and you can be asked a simple uh, yeah, a note about it in your theory exam or can be asked like how if you have been had uh, made to, to uh, demonstrate any instrument, you know, how is it autoclave? It's as simple as that. So, autoclaving is a process in which pressurized steam is used. Its merits are that it is not very expensive, it's highly effective, it is rapid, and it doesn't have any toxicity over the, uh, for the environment and over the instruments. But demerits are it's not suitable for oils, powders, ointments, and closed glass chambers. If you want to sterilize the uh, test tube in which you sometimes put the gauze or sorry, sorry a cotton for sending some microbiology sample you can't uh, do that for autoclaving and for rubbers and plastics uh, it, as it operates under high uh, pressure and uh, temperature so it can vent so the time and temperature for autoclaving generally is, ranges from 20 to 60 minutes 20 minutes to 1 hour and the Temperature is from 121 to 180 degrees centigrade. And it is ideal for all operating like metallic instruments, surgical gowns, drapes, dressings. You can get anything autoclave. Yeah, except for these oils, powders, ointments, closed glass chambers, rubbers, and plastic instruments. Hot air in oven has been uh, uh, out of fashion recently, but it, it, it works. How does it work? It, works on the principle of dry heat. It is non-corrosive as it, it functions on the dry heat. It's, it's merit and it's inexpensive and non-toxic. But it's uh, it's not that effective because a pressurized steam, it leads to more penetration into that, uh, what I was telling you about an instrument tray. It, uh, pressurized steam penetrates and, uh, you know, even can get into the uh, joints, and uh, small, smaller things, but hot air oven, what it does, increases the temperature. So it, it's uh, longer duration is required. Okay, it is put in the demerits that it, we need longer duration for it. And it is not that effective as autoblading. So it, oh, we need to have at least one hour to 80 minutes to get this uh, thing going for the instruments and uh, it operates at 340 degrees current but you can do that oils powders etc with this metallic instruments and open glass vials not closed ones with a hot air oven ETO has recently been under some uh, controversy keeping its uh, you know inflammatory and uh, some carcinogenic properties it's uh, that's why it's not uh, very popular these days. Basically controversial. Uh, okay, let me just cover it, but try not to mention it anywhere in your uh, in the first you know order of uh, if you are asked anything about the sterilization. Heat labile tubes like vitrect vitrectomy tubes or something like FICO tubings, plastic handles and blades. Now we used to get it. ETO long time back, I think around uh, 2014 or something. Wires, uh, uh, you can see DLCP probes with wires, laser probes if you need the sterilized or uh, cutters. And if anything you want for longer storage and ready to use pack, 
sterilize it, pack it, and you can carry it for uh, you know other at uh, if you want to operate at some other place. But it's toxic and it was expensive. And there was caution to the handlers. It was mentioned earlier also that it can be carcinogenic and sometimes under some special circumstances can be explosive and relatively longer cycle time. So that's why the, all the instruments used to be get uh, we used to club it. Uh, so it was done once a week and longer aeration time is required. Aeration is to reduce the toxicity because otherwise people, so many vitreous surgeons, they experience tasks like uh, you know inflammation after you know operating uh, with the ETO sterilized vitreous cutter. A previously used, reused basically vitreous cutter with the ETO, then they used to uh, experience some inflammation in post-operative period. Then they slowly, slowly everything that longer aeration time is required if you want to reduce the toxicity. Uh, up to 6 to 12 hours is required. That's why it's very long. Vitreous cutters, paper tubings, all these optical fiber light pipes, silicon stents, acrylic orbital implants, conformers, plastic eye shields, cryoprobes, everything used to get ETO. Now, what we have got is plasma. If plasma uses hydrogen peroxide, it has got shorter cycle as compared to the ETO. Ready to use plastic heat level materials, you can do its is merit wires and longer storage as compared to ETO and but it's the itself you need a special packing for it if there's a specific packing uh, machine which you need uh, for packing first instruments uh, before putting it into the plasma machine it's expensive it's near to I think uh, 50 or 50 lakh or uh, 75 lakhs but it, it's used basically for an uh, institute like uh, have got you can uh, have multi specialty people using this 75 to 80 minutes is the cycle and uh, everything same what ETO can do this can do chemical disinfectants are readily available in our OPDs they're quick so this now was for quick and ready method and inexpensive we all the hospitals order glutaral high two percent and uh, but remember these instruments are not to be used for any intraocular or intracranial or something like cavity, closed cavity procedures and need a thorough wash because it's chemically treated, it's thoroughly washed, proper human rinsing, you know, cannulas if you have used or something, you need to rinse it properly. Uh, it's toxic, it's toxic to uh, anything in off the life. So chemical disinfectants, yes, the time period is around two to three hours, yeah, three to four is okay. It's brilliant for my endoscopes. So if you can do it, autoclaving, it's a kind of risk, but uh, chemical disinfectants, okay, there's, they do not operate under pressure, steam pressure. So brilliant for nasal endoscopic tips, endoscope uh, uh, sterilization, as we have uh, seen and that in the scalding classification, the endoscopes were categorized as semi-critical. Nasal packing forceps or plastic glass airways, which you use, you know, the stuff which you need in minor routine that can be used. No big no for any intraocular procedure. And uh, specifically, if you go by the Spalding's classification, semi critical instruments. So remember these. Uh, and uh, these are the images of some images from my uh, book only. This is a standard autoclave on the right side. This standard autoclave, how it it, you know, it's uh, steam packed. You can see the manometers over here. They like uh, how uh, for at how much pressure the steam is uh, operating. So you need an outlet of the steam, which is valved. There's a valve for it. And you can release the pressure from here. You can see this handle over here, black handle near the manometers. So that can be used to release the uh, steam pressure from inside and rotate this handle and uh, you know these things will curl up and uh, will lead to opening of this cavity. This was a standard autoclave. Uh, now we have got uh, digital standard autoclaves. Uh, it's, everything is digitalized. You can see the manometers over there. It's all uh, relatively clean, no uh, big uh, manual stuff to be done. This is a, uh, you know, you can see this packed, linen packed uh, instruments or probably some other stuff, some drapes also linen, which we use to uh, drape the patient after cleaning. 
So those everything is autoclave. So you can have a, and all the autoclaving cycles are mentioned on this strip, this computerized strip which comes out of this, like that uh, billing machine. And this is not to be thrown. So this this record needs to be preserved. If in case anything, uh, you know, uh, something happens uh, for after one week or so, some uh, procedures got uh, some infections or something, you can always go back and uh, look for what happened in that cycle. Now. And uh, for that machine people also, that's mandatory. It's mandatory you and you need to keep this record. Okay. It's by digital standard autoclave. I'll go a bit uh, relatively, you know, how to basically handle that whole uh, system where we, where, where our uh, precious instruments are sterilized and given to us and uh, we use them uh, uh, free in our mind that, okay, so everything is, is supposed to be sterilized properly. This is how a plasma sterilization machine looks like. This is a sterard machine and uh, this is how it looks like. Same way, this uh, plasma cycles, its uh, record is there. And uh, this record you need to keep. On the right side of the image, there's uh, a button where you can see the start cycle, then cancel if you forgot something or some thing has happened. Close the door, open the door. And uh, if you can see this, this uh, over the black thing, there's something green written over there. It, these are the cycles of uh, or the stages. If this uh, the first stage is written as vacuum, so if vacuum is going on, under vacuum built up, hai, then the machine this will be green. So vacuum will be green over there. Then there is uh, something like injection, diffusion, plasma, and venting. Everything. I do not go into details, but uh, you should know what plasma sterilization works with. Plasma constitutes highly ionized gas composed of ionic particles, electrons, neutrons, everything. So produced by excitation of gas or vapors by radio frequency or microwaves. So that gas vapors are excited by radio frequency or microwaves in a closed chamber under low vacuum. Then it leads to plasma. Plasma is there in galaxies, okay, They're like in space. Here we create it and use it for our you know, sterilization energy basically. It uses hydrogen peroxide in the gas or vapor form. Then it's bombarded with uh, radio frequency or microwaves. Plasma constitutes low temperature sterilization in which polypropylene, poly, olefin, and plastic have preferably. Uh, uh, you can use that as a wrapping material. It will not melt off. So it's low temperature sterilization. The cellular, cellulose component of paper and cloth absorbs the peroxide. So uh, that is relatively avoided inside. So you don't put cloth or cellulose paper wrappings because uh, then it will absorb that H2O2 and peroxide and prevent its effective penetration. Those uh, it will not ionize basically after once it's absorbed. We'll go to the next slide. That's chemical sterilization. It's uh, very uh, Frequently used in our minor rotis, I told you earlier also, glutaraldehyde 2% is an effective sterilizing agent. And in a liquid form, you can use heat labile equipments, like which will melt off in heat. Endoscopes, love it for that. Metal instruments you can use, but not for intraocular procedures. And uh, they, these should be thoroughly washed and rinsed. And isopropyl alcohol is uh, up to 70%. You can use, it's a low cost relatively as compared to glutaraldehyde uh, for ophthalmic lenses. Like uh, these days, if uh, you guys are also experiencing a kind of epidemic going on of conjunctivitis, so it's good to you clean the tips of applanation or indentation tonometers. This can be asked as a table viva question. What thing will you use for cleaning the tip of a tonometer? Isopropyl alcohol 70%. Perfect answer. And other OPD or OT metallic instruments, okay? It should be wiped to dry before use. Just clean that trip with a, uh, some dry paper. It's highly inflammable. And other chemical agents like sodium hypochlorite or chlorhexidine can also be used. And 10% covidone iodine, but it uh, does have uh, color uh, issues. So what is the shelf life once you have sterilized an instrument? 
I have done autoclaving for my uh, okay for my uh, instruments. That's a pressurized steam. For how long I, I can store? Seventy two hours, three days. Only in a controlled environment, having a temperature of twenty to twenty four degrees centigrade, where bacteria can't proliferate much and humidity of less than sixty percent. If these criteria are met, you can store up to three days, seventy two hours. Hot air oven, uh, don't use it. Uh, so it depends. Ki kya cheez the lies kya hai. ETOs three months. Uh, but we used to do early. But uh, that was the merit of plasma over ETO that you can use for six months. Once you have uh, used the plasma sterilization, you can use even after three, four, five, or six months. Up to six months. Chemical disinfectants, you need to use it that day or you know within an hour or so something. And uh, basically, the peroxide you need to repeat it, uh, use it, and glutaraldehyde you can yeah uh, after once my endoscope is disinfected properly, semi-critical instrument. So I use uh, uh, sterilium or uh, propyl alcohol isopropyl alcohol just to wash off for the another patient. Don't, I don't put it again and again into glutaraldehyde for two hours. So we are done with the cleaning and uh, sterilization of instruments. So remember that classification. It's not always sterilization. Sterilization is ideal, but we can get away with some uh, high quality disinfection or cleaning in some non-critical instruments like BP cuff or something like tensocalmonical or something. Okay, I hope this was a uh, kind of uh, okay with the sterilization part of the instruments. The rest we have covered in our first part. Now I'll go to the uh, questions which were asked in the last, you know, class. So FACO tips and sleeves was the question. This uh, A part is the these are the sleeves over which from which the irrigation fluid comes into the and THML. Okay, so these are the irrigation outlets. You can see these holes over here. These are the irrigation outlets. This red one is 2.2 and the orange one is 2.8. And uh, we used to have 3 or 3.2. I think that was purplish. We don't use that now. I think. So this was the Kalman tip design. 45 degree angulation. And uh, I was telling you last time if you have uh, uh, attended that, that this is a balanced tip design. This a little curve in the Kalman tip, this little curve is a balanced tip design. So it takes care of what Kalman uh, tip doesn't provide us in the uh, anti chamber. So these are sleeves and FACO tips. This angulation is 40 degrees. Okay, let's go to this very, very interesting slide. I, I want you to focus on, okay, let's go one by one. Top left image. This is the Kalman's 45 degree ABS FACO tip. And this maximum amplitude is 130 micrometers. So amplitude is how much it can move, 130 micrometers. This, uh, uh, this is the balanced tip or 45 degree ABS FACO tip. You can see how, how it has gone over its axis and then came back into its axis. This tip went off its axis. So when it will vibrate, the frequency, the, the you know, the... Uh, Emulsification it will cause, it will be relatively more, you know, you can say uh, turbulent inside the AC. This is the balance tip. You'll have minimum turbulence. You're, you're, you'll see clearly and uh, uh, the nucleus piece will be glued to the tip. Glued, kind of, you know, it's there over the tip on. So this is a balance tip, which I think uh, is, uh, so I'll not paint the fake omission in so uh, this is how the irrigation sleeve works. Irrigation sleeve over this metallic FACO tip. This is the irrigation sleeve. You can see inside is the metallic FACO. This was, I was talking about in the last uh, talk that this pink area, you can see this pink area. Just imagine this is the inner diameter of a tip and this blue area is the flange or the outer, uh, you can see the rim diameter of the rim, this one. And the pink area is the inner diameter. You see here, if uh, you keep this diameter same and increase the inner lumen, 
so it will lead to more aspiration and as compared to this thing it will lead to more aspiration so need you need to reduce your flow rate here it's it will lead to more emulsification if you have got a more rim diameter that's called as a, a flare tip or a cobra tip I, I, I told last time so what are the facts about FACO tips? Its angulation may vary up to from zero degree straight tips. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm talking about the end on view. It's zero degree, it can be 30, 45, or 60 degrees. 60 degree, it will give you maximum amount of cutting. And zero degree will give you minimum amount of cutting. But 45 degree gives you an uh, adequate amount of cut with an oval area as compared to a round area, a round area will have lesser surface diameter for suction and oval area will have more surface diameter for suction. So that suction gives you a good grip over the nucleus so that you can chop it. More the angulation, lesser the holding power and more the cutting power. That's why they have just moved uh, that uh, tip in a kind of a balanced tip design for more cutting power. Holding is okay. Distal opening is the uh, aspiration port. The, obviously, the irrigation is kept, the sleeve is kept proximal. So, uh, the metallic tip will go distal. The types of tips are standard tip, Kelman tip, micro tip. Uh, this everything is uh, Cobra tip, Turbosonics. Some machines, they have given their own names and all. This is all available in the book. Size of the incision depends on the tip and tip gauge and the sleeve, basically sleeve. So hard cataracts needs more part of exposed tip. Hard cataracts, you need to bury for longer length in the nucleus. So this is the nucleus and this is the tip. So you can't stay over the surface and try to chop. Uh, your things will slip away. So need to bury more. If you want to bury more, so need to expose the metallic tip more. Keep the FACO, uh, you know, sleeve the irrigation sleeve away. Let the exposed tip be more so that it can bury more into the because once that uh, rubber thing, the silicon sleeve will come in contact with the nucleus, it will not let it go inside. So, acoustic energy is uh, produced along the ultrasonic handpiece. How does it work basically? How does fake machine work? Acoustic energy is produced along the ultrasonic handpiece, is transmitted onto the nucleus through the tip. One is the acoustic energy. The another is a jackhammer effect. Third thing is the thermal energy. And fourth and most important thing is the, these are the implosions or cavitation. What I love to teach is cavitation. That's the most important thing which is causing the nucleus to emulsify. If you don't know it, know about it, read about it. Cavitation, uh, I'm not here to teach FACO, so. Uh, and read about these four uh, parameters by which your nucleus emulsifies when you put the FACO probe over the nucleus or inside the nucleus. So, neo tips, CFO, OZEL, okay, not going to that. So, these are the instruments, you know, this is a wrench with which you can change the FACO tip also. In between all surgery, or uh, if you want to remove it from the previous surgeon, you can use the another one, use the wrench to loosen the tip and remove it. And FACO sleeve is a silicone sleeve to cover over the FACO tip. It has got two holes on the sides, the irrigation holes, 180 degrees apart, comes in a variety of sizes and colors based on the tip configuration. Sizes are 19 gauge, 20, 21 and 23 gauge. I told you about the gauges in the sutures last time. Uh, 19 is not the Autoclaved or ETO sterilized. ETO is not Basically, you can autoclave these silicon, it will not melt away. Helps to keep the FACO energy localized at the tip. So basically, it's to cool down and uh, prevent leakage from the corneal wound. It plugs in the uh, corneal wound from which the FACO probe is entering and improves nuclear component followability. Uh, you know, uh, it causes that uh, uh, turbulence inside the AC. This is a test chamber which uh, first before going into the AC you should use if you are going for a first case that I know after after that only I think the FACO machine starts. And this is a silicon chamber which you put over once you have 
put that uh, wrenched that tip and then put the sleeve over it and then put a test chamber over it and then tune uh, the FACO emulsification machine. So the FACO emulsification machine knows that how the suction and everything is working fine or not. Uh, you guys got my FACO revised. And uh, this is uh, that figure A is, uh, I can't say it's a dual bevel or single bevel. So read about it. What is dual bevel or single bevel? This is a keratome and uh, must be 2.8 or something like that. And this is a 1.5 millimeter dual bevel. Okay, you can see at the dual bevel side board, this angulated side board. And the other one is crimson blue, which you use for uh, SICS surgeries. And these are left hand instruments. And uh, the first one is a chopper. That's how it looks like. This is the cutting edge and this is the tip with which you bury this chopper inside the nucleus metal. This is a Silsky hook. It doesn't chop, so it doesn't have a cutting edge or a tip, burying tip. It's a hook. You need to just uh, rotate some uh, pieces of the nucleus or feed your uh, FACO tip. And uh, you can use a uh, Y hook. It gives you uh, kind of 180 degree. Other, other, it adds on to the other dimensional uh, movement. Of the nucleus. Okay, I think uh, I will stop my sharing of screen now. We're done with the presentation. Thank you so much, sir, for such a beautiful presentation. We really liked it. Uh, as like into the first part, more interesting with further detailing on instruments, the FACO tips. The questions answered from the previous sessions really appreciate that uh, piece of work also apart from your topic today thank you for that sir so we thank also you. have uh, a lot of questions on uh, a lot start. of okay can we please go <laughs> with that yeah 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 please yes sir so one person has asked uh, what are the basics of ETO stabilization basics basics basic it, it's ethylene oxide it's a gas so gas is uh, used, it's under pressure used for sterilization of the instruments. So that gas, if it, and I told you about the cycle also, it, is, uh, it remains there for, uh, you know, six to eight hours inside the instruments and packed instruments. So that's why that ethylene oxide gas itself is toxic and carcinogen. So that's why after sterilization with ETO, we used to air keep those instruments in air. That's called as aeration step. It's nothing, just keep the instruments in air in kind of open air where there is more air circulation so that there is minimum toxicity. Uh, this uh, uh, is like banned now for in IT neuro and off -hand. People don't use it. But in some institutes, if they have got, they do not have plasma, they might be using it. But then aeration is the most critical step to avoid uh, any uh, toxicity. It's ethylene oxide basically pressurized. Yes, sir. So one of the uh, viewers online has asked, should we clean the tip of epilination tonometry after each patient? Will it affect the life of a prism? Assuming no epidemic of a viral, conjuncti viral conjunctivitis. No, it will not affect the life of prism. You can use it. I think you should use it. I will not get like to get my cornea uh, put with the other. That is, is there some virus infection. It's not about conjunctivitis viral infections. It's about other viruses also. You can have you know uh, some transmissible viruses which we uh, sometimes don't be wanted for like corneal. Uh, transplant contraindicated viruses. If, if, if I am not mistaken, the con con say viruses and some uh, fancy name. So any viral infection, anything sticking on to the tonometer, why you need to put it? Like, it's better to clean it after every procedure, after every patient. It will not affect the life of tonometer. Yes, sir. So um, in ophthalmic plastic surgery or likewise, where we use surgical markers for making marking the incision line 
or uh, for any other procedure for that matter. So how do we sterilize the surgical markers? So, uh, see, there are some disposable items and otherwise we can use ink. The ink is NDI or something like any uh, blue ink which is uh, available. It's also ethylene ink only. And you can sterilize it by hot air oven or how you use uh, these uh, sterilized uh, uh, rubbers and uh, hot air oven is best way. Or these inks are available in a dried form and then diluted with 50% uh, with the distilled water or DSS solution which is available on trolley. Otherwise, what we use, uh, we don't use these uh, dried inks, but uh, pre-sterilized packed uh, surgical marker pens, which you might also be using the surgical marker pens. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what would be the ideal duration for sterilization through a formalin chamber? Formalin chamber, again, it's a controversial thing. We do not use it in institutions and uh, but sometimes, you know, for uh, lenses, for the 20D lens or something, if you don't want to put it in a chemical, don't want to put it under pressure, these lenses, and repeated corrosive substances. The best is just to sterilize with the gas. But plasma is a better way you can use, but you need to remove everything from the, the pack. Because lens surface once gets uh, corroded with any ionized particle, then it will lead to damage of lens. Uh, if you want to put uh, anything in the formalin chamber, right, acrylic chamber, which we used to have earlier, it is like off record, but it should not be used. First of all, try to avoid it. Otherwise, if you want to use a formalin uh, tablet, which is wrapped in a cloth or something, and put it in, at the corner of acrylic box, 24 hours is the duration. So if you want to use one day, uh, like next day, you have to use it uh, in a uh, uh, twenty-four hours minimum. And two tablets, I think, two tablets versus four tablets for a box of there was some dimension, but we do not use it. And uh, it was being used for lenses specifically, twenty D lenses to interop uh, while doing the uh, that uh, buckle procedure especially. Okay. So but the no, uh, big no for uh, sorry to interrupt. Big no for formalin and DTU. That should be the answer in the exam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Point well taken, sir. So the next question is: uh, uh, Can you provide some info about the biological indicators used in sterilization and which indicator is to be used in what situation? Yes. Bacillus subtilis. So bacillus subtilis is uh, one uh, uh, biological indicator. It's basically available in the tape form. Or like uh, these are uh, strips, basically. It's put it after cleaning, drying, before wrapping. Just put a biological indicator strip inside and close it. And uh, you pack it, get it sterilized, biotoclaving or plasma, whatever. And once you get it out and you are going to use it, you open and first see what is the color change. Bacillus subtilis, it changes from no color to red color once it is properly sterilized. And then this is the bovi dick test and all. Uh, I think uh, so, so many people don't do it. Simple is uh, that uh, 3M chemical indicator tape. Just tear a tape, a uh, piece of tape, put corn sterilized, kar hai, what is the date, Upa dalo, put it in autoclave or plasma, Jab bahar aega, it will all be black. If that indicators are black, it's good to use for 72 hours for autoclave. Yes. So, uh, how frequently do we need to send a swab sample from a microscope or OT surface? Uh, every week, ideally. Every week. But it's basically if you are uh, fumigating it enough on every Saturday or something like that. So, then even one month or two months they do. But if you are asked this question in the examination every week. Right. And that when is it done? That is more important. After doing that fumigation, after doing that cleaning disinfection, then you take a sample from the surface, from the floor, then air, and then uh, 
the surfaces are divided into less than three feet, more than three feet, air and roof. The four things and microbiology people, uh, they come sometimes, they can take it or you can take it under sterilized uh, thing and uh, then you have to wait for the report. Okay. So one question uh, pertaining to instruments from the previous class, if I can just ask you, was different types of AC maintainers. Can you please add a note on it? And TH chamber maintainers. Hanji. I'm not a straightforward, I am not a FACO guy uh, anymore, but uh, AC maintainers, if I'm not uh, wrong, you are talking about that uh, an additional cannula which we used to put. Correct. That, which is a part of that, the Blumenthal's technique and all that where we use a yeah, I think that SICS technique, uh, I, I'm not very familiar with it. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, uh, I you I can uh, provide you that answer. Probably you read the book, then might be that NTA segment. All right. So whosoever has asked this question, please. Uh, yeah, take for FACO, you don't need it. But for yeah. SICS, I think that that is a thing to be done. Yes. So uh, sorry for that. This question. Please find this as an opportunity to always go back to read through Sir's uh, beautiful book, which he displayed it uh, as a PDF last time. Uh, so probably at the end of this session also, I would request you that you please display the same PDF so that the students can, those who have not attended the previous session or going to view this later, they will yeah. have uh, insight into what the book actually contains chapter wise and also by the photographs. And show you, I, I will show you. Any other question? Yes, sir. We have a few more. Can I please go ahead? Aha, uh -huh, please. Um, so, uh, one of the questions is uh, from Mr. Umesh is that, so now we have to change the tubings in each surgery if the plasma is not available. Apart from ETO and plasma, any other option for instruments with the lumen? Not okay. Mm. No worries. We get it out of clear. Fico sleeves, tips, silicon, anything we can get it out of clear. Yeah, it should not melt basically. Plastics. Uh, these are silicon basically. Silicon, medical grade silicon, it doesn't melt at uh, this much temperature. We, we use it. We get them out of Cutters and tubes. So two questions, uh, pretty basic, but yet important. One pertaining to our uh, workplace, the OPD, and second work to our OT. The first part of the question is, how do we clean our slit lamp? That is the first part of the question. And the second part of the question pertaining to OT is, what is a healthy practice to be followed by any junior resident getting into ophthalmology with regards to his presence in the OT? Well, the second one is a bit, uh, I think, uh very specific and important. Uh, all the questions are important. The first one I will answer quickly. Uh, how to clean your slit lamp. That's very, very important. And uh, whosoever asked and uh, thank you for that. Uh, so how to clean the slit lamp? Just use that isopropyl alcohol. It is cheap. Remember that. Glutaraldehyde thoda sister karega nahi chahiye ja kuch something. And it is corrosive also. Glutaraldehyde thoda sa corrosive hai as compared to isopropyl alcohol, 70% or what at the base. So keep those isopropyl alcohol things like uh, tip of your polio uh, prism of uh, applanation tonometer and uh, lenses, eyepieces or the where from where the slit uh, or the light comes. That's slit lamp part from where the light is projected, the light part. Whatever is... Uh, you know, in the optical axis, clean it with the isopropyl alcohol. One swap, swipe, that's it. Assay, 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 you need not to do. One swipe and that's it. Okay. If it is having grease, uh, it's showing grease, then you can do a perpendicular swipe. That's it. Visible grease in that part. Otherwise, one swipe. Clean that optically clear media. With isopropyl alcohol, rest you can clean with normal spirit. I sometimes use sterilium spirit is a bit corrosive. Uh, and uh, isopropyl alcohol, if you have got uh, available, it's uh, good. 
you can clean the uh, base with the sterilium or uh, spirit. What is sterilium? Anyone? It's one to two, one propanol and two propanol. And its percentages, I always keep on asking that is 70%. Yes, sir. And the second part of the question, sir, now. Yeah. Uh, so for a resident who has first, I think, uh, if I am not wrong, the question was uh, an ophthalmology resident who is stepping into ophthalmology OT for the first time. Yes, sir. Is it correct? Yes, sir. So how should he get scrapped for some? Like, uh, what is the healthy much? practice in general? What are the do's and don'ts in the OT? Which part of the OT he should not enter into or should not venture into? And what is the healthy practice pertaining to uh, instrumentation in the OT? How careful he should be? I think it's a, it, it needs a very specific answer. I'll not be clear. I, I'll not be uh, straightforward forward about it because we do not it's all about how you see others behaving inside the OT. The first and foremost thing, do not touch here and there. After, after you have uh, uh, you know, changed and worn your slippers, use alcohol, uh, use uh, sterilium to clean your hands first. Do not touch. Practice this cross hand position. Just cross your hands and uh, keep your fingers away. Uh, you know, First, observe how the how the others are doing, and if you want to avoid an area where you should not visit, that should be the autoclave room. Do not visit it. See it from outside how the things are done, because that is the maximum sterilized area. And while uh, you know, observe how a cataract surgeon or uh, or any uh, surgeon is scrubbing for first time in the day not uh, during in between the surgeries, how that surgeon is scrubbing for the first time in a day. I want to emphasize that our, our skin has got lipid biofilm, which is when once, once we enter the OT, it's always there. So before putting betadine on the hands for scrubbing, use soap and water to clean once so that that lipid layer, that area, uh, you know, the skin pores are now clear for the beta D application and it will be able to penetrate better over the skin air, over, you know, the rugis of the uh, surface of the epidermis. So it will be better if you use soap first before using beta D. And uh, you know, the answer is not very specific. I told you in the first book uh, and what we practice in our institute is first is the orientation program, which is held by the nursing officer present inside the OT. Uh, the first batch who comes, they get an orientation around the OT, how they should behave in a crossed position. We get to know that, okay, these are the first year GB residents who are doing like this and uh, you know, have an orientation with them. So we can't be very specific how they should behave. They should learn and watch and learn. And watch any surgeon scrubbing for the first time in the all right. So now can we just have a glimpse into your book on yeah, yeah. instrumentation? That uh, book I already told that it was a push by my residents only who used to um, knocking, looking after me and knocking at my door. At in mostly in April and then November, December, exams were going to happen. I'll share my screen with the PDF. So, this is how it looks like. Uh, this is by Springer. Uh, Springer guys were also very excited to uh, get this ophthalmic instruments and surgical tools. I'll quickly go to the index part of the book. Yeah, and thankfully uh, our uh, mentor, Dr. Amod Gupta, he wrote the, uh, you know, foreword for this book. And uh, I'll, I'll like to mention these, uh, just read these lines. Uh, 
so the make material description and sterilization of surgical instruments are often overlooked and ignore entity the surgical instruments are mostly looked at and read by students before exams with great difficulties in collecting the information and remembering a fresh as an entirely new aspect this book will go a long way in helping the readership and educating nursing staff students residents fellows and clinicians in practice so try to read the words of uh, sir in this book uh, if you can see this is the index okay so first chapter was instrument sterilization and care uh, jagjit malhotra used to be the ans uh, of assistant nursing superintendent of advanced eye center ot and after that the second chapter is on ophthalmic sutures and needles also uh, mainly contributed by parmish pujani and priya from gmch the basics of surgical instruments how the instruments are made fab, uh, furnished and uh, how these are uh, actually provided to you even right from the material and everything its definition uh, basics was covered by me sonam contributed then natasha and uh, manpreet manpreet is my wife anterior segment surgeon surgery instruments see anterior segment surgery instruments were basically taken over by dr parul natasha and uh, monica and sahil who mix from gmch and pj instruments of posterior segment surgery was uh, looked after by dr diksha general instruments of ophthalmic plastic surgery because ophthalmic plastics have got very valuable uh, instruments for each surgery so i i uh, put a, put my foot forward ki i want different okay somebody asked about dci surgery also na last time i'll try uh, instruments for lacrimal surgeries then nasal endoscopic endovision system everything about endoscopy right from the basic how the head how the light source works and everything that's also there chapter 8 then eyelid enucleation orbit surgeries and common instruments used in refractive surgeries was contributed by dr chintan arunjay and refractive surgeries the laser machines and then basic operating room machines right from the microscope uh, i think phaco machine vitrectomy machine and uh, cryo machine and then uh, laser machine and uh, our radio frequency for radio machine everything is there in that it's free to be downloaded from springer website yes sir so a note on uh, the dcr instrumentation sir yeah i see me se bata do i forgot i was carried away by peko <laughs> so uh, i try to get these uh, instrument uh, images from magnified view and few described over the skull uh, calipers not the general instruments practical pearls and we have a practical pearls also that was added at the last moment even uh, professor uh, amur gupta was not not knowing about it uh, you know practical pearls kaha problem aati hai and what what can you do so lacrimal surgeries okay instruments is my slide visible uh, not yet sir acha stop sir you can see and it is it is held in the fingers like this you use these two fingers just clamp it and it will uh it will uh, these two blades will come uh, near each other they will get a post then you insert it in the nasal cavity right following the hard palate and right? it's all there here you can uh, read about it and uh, this is tilly's nasal packing forceps how it looks this is a this is the bent or the bayonet design which i was telling this this you know specific thing which 
This is called as knurling. K N U R L I N G. Knurling. This knurling was invented by Jose Braquer. So knurling gives you a rotational movement right from the fingertips. So this is knurled uh, nettle chip uh, punctum dilator. Castro Vijo has got two. Uh, so two-sided instrument. Castro Vijo's punctum dilator. Wilders is long taper one. The taper is long. And then the Bowman's or Clark's probes. These probes, you know, sometimes uh, this question is asked, what is this zero and double zero? This zero is, just remember, uh, I I tell my residents, just thoda sa, uh, yaad kar lo. two zeros are like eight. Eight has got two zeros. So this is point eight. Nine has got kind of one zero. And it's, you know, when we write nine, it has got one zero. So zero is point nine mm or one mm is, 0 mm. It point, it's, it's 1 mm basically. 1 is 1 mm. 0 is 0 0.9. 2 zeros are 0 0.8. And uh, after that, 3 zeros, 0 0.7 and 0 0.6 mm diameter. But it varies, you know, right from the manufacturer. Here it's written that uh, Bowman's is 0 0.7 is 4. Castro Vigo's is 0 0.8. 9 is 2 zeros, 2 zeros is sorry, 0, this 0 and you have to count this 0. So this uh, is 2 zeros is 9, 0.9 and 3 zeros is 0.8. You have to count this 0 also, 0 0.8. So 3 zeros is 0.8 and 4 zeros is 0 0.7. And how to handle it? This is a worst, modified worst pigtail lacrimal probe. Sometimes we use it for during the repair of canonical lacerations. And then it is a periosteum elevator. How we use it over, where we use it. Sometimes uh, we use it over the skull. These images are there. And this is NAPS cats for a retractor. NAPS one is uh, closely placed, uh, these paws. And if it's, these are widely placed, this is Rolands. Otherwise, generally it's NAPS. This is how it looks like. And these tips are basically kept blunt. Naps, cats, for it. And these are the garrison punches. Citrulline punch has got this, this type of uh, hole at the, at the back. From where the bone can get, it can come out after punching. From garrison, you need to remove the bone from here or probably from here. So in settlies, you need not to remove the bone. You can keep on uh, punching, but you need a wider tool for operating with settlies. It comes in 1.5 mm diameter, two, three, four. This is how you have hold it. And uh, then this is again kill a double ended. And this is a uh, bone file. Some have to make moves. And this is bone nibbler, sometimes used for endoscopic DCS surgeries, uh, a kind of standing uh, ledge like thing over the bone. And this has got double action joint. This is a box type joint. These are Friedman's bone nibblers. And this was a kind of ancient instrument <laughs> chisel and uh, mallet. For the one is called as mallet or hammer. This is a chisel, hammer and chisel. This is a uh, cannula's. Uh, how does it look from this? It's a beautiful picture. I think I not to it. And uh, these are self retaining Stevenson uh, Ag Agricola meters. Uh, we don't need the cats for attracted to be held by the resident or uh, assistant. So you can use this. I have not never used it. Uh, actually, a key for many variabilities. Uh, shoot, this is uh, an another. Ancient instrument, Ariuga's lacrimal profile, uh, developed by Ariuga. It, this profile has got, uh, so this handle uh, what used to be rotated once this, you know, axis was inserted into the bone via that lacrimal bone. Just it was, it used to enter it and then the surgeon used to rotate it. Just I, I can't imagine how, how the patient might be feeling with this. Ariuga's lacrimal profile, it's ancient. Handle. It, this is uh, for the lateral instruments. So, it was a revisiting history also. It was like 
nice experience. And I wrote this book. Always gives a very good feeling to know who the people were behind these instrumentations and regarding respect uh, to these individuals who have spent their time uh, in making so many instruments, even a, in a discovery or invention of one single instrument takes a lifetime. Exactly. I think uh, that's why I um, pay tribute to two of the gentlemen who contributed maximum, Roman Castoviju and Jose Barakur. That knurling design was invented by Barakur. Thank you so very much, sir, for both these lovely sessions. Uh, too much in detail for our postgraduate students. I really appreciate your uh, effort put into uh, selecting these topics so carefully and then uh, joining the uh, lets of a chain to uh, make it very beautiful for our audience. Um, I hope that all the students who shall just watch this now have a keen interest in reading them well before the examinations which helps yes. them go back to their OPD or OT and uh, have a practical view of their instruments and then help them become better surgeons at the end of the day. That is our aim in having this module. So before we conclude for uh, tonight, uh, I would like to make a very small announcement that we begin the oculoplasty module from the 2nd of August. And uh, the first lecture is by none other than Dr. Santosh Navasar and it is on anatomy of eyelids. Please join in, sir, if you're free on that day. I, I, I would love to. Sure, sir. Thank you so very much, sir. A very, very good night, sir. Thank you so much. And know your tools. Definitely.